welcome to Living to Love Yourself podcast. I am so grateful to have you here today. I have a special guest, Jennifer Allen, who will be discussing the seriousness of breast implant illness. Jennifer Allen is a registered nurse and women's advocate. Her desire is for women to love themselves more than they love their implants and to know they never needed them in the first place. Her mission is to spread awareness of breast implant illness as many women may not be even aware of this being the cause of their suffering. So without a further delay, I'd like to have Jennifer Allen on the platform. Hi, Jennifer. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you for being part of the show today. Yes. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So, Jennifer, let's let's just begin and understand if we can get a fair idea of what even breast implants are, because I want to make sure that the listeners get a basic understanding of why you need them, breast implants, and what are the differences with breast implants? Well, breast implants are a medical prosthesis used to quote unquote, enhance a woman's breast. Um, they, there are two types. There are silicone and then saline filled, but the one important commonality that they both share is that the shell is made of silicone in both both types. Both types, the saline and the silicone, correct. So Jennifer, you mentioned that the main reason is for breast augmentation, whether it's reconstructive reasons, which is breast cancer or mastectomy or Mm -hmm cosmetic purposes. So in both of them, we'll go a little further during the show and understand there are quite potential risks associated with either of those purposes. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So we would like to start with understanding more reasons for considering breast implants from your angle. Why did you choose that? Did you have any health concerns? What was your reason? I, I didn't have any actual health concerns. I grew up like a lot of young women, women, very flat chested, very insecure about my body. Um, constantly being shown through the media that to be beautiful, you have to have, you know, these big, beautiful, perfect breasts. And so I decided at a very young age that I was going to get them. And I did at the age of 24, thinking that, you know, they were going to boost my confidence. Wow. That's so at age 24, you went and had surgery. Can I ask you, did you research on breast implant when you, or did you just go to a physician and you just readily agreed to have breast implants? I researched obsessively about <laughs> breast implants. <laughs> Even though I um, I wasn't a nurse yet, I hadn't been to nursing school, um, but I have just always been the type of person that needs to know all of the information before I you know go all in on something. And so I did. If there was a side effect that could happen that you know I that was out there for me to find, I found it. And so I made what I thought was you know a very smart educated choice at the time amazing <clears throat> which which one did you go with with the breast implant was that the saline or the silicon i chose the saline implant saline. Yeah. and because silicon i'm assuming because silicon has is the higher risk is that why you chose that well, was there a difference at the um, time they were claiming that the silicone was just as safe but i was in my research, you know, still reading stories about things that happened to women in the 90s. And so I decided for myself, I needed to wait a while, see what happened with those. And then mm-hmm. maybe when I went to, for my replacement, then I would consider silicone later. So you were even thinking in the future to replace with silicone? Yes. Interesting. So what happened from age 24 onwards? What, what made you come and speak 
here today about why breast implant may not be the fairest option for you. Well, shortly after I got my implants, I would say even weeks after, um, I began feeling very tired all the time at 24. And they, uh, I went to my regular primary doctor who sent me to an endocrinologist because I have Graves' disease also. Um, and they just kept, you know, blaming my thyroid. And I've been through every test you could imagine, and they couldn't find anything that would be making me tired. So I was told it's because I had two small children and that I was probably depressed and that I should go see a psychiatrist and move on with my life. So that <laughs> led me to, um, well, you know, first, you know, frustration and then over time starting to, you know, really dig deep and try to figure out what else could this be. Right. Yeah. So what age did you start having these type of symptoms, these illnesses, and you started seeking the doctor? The fatigue happened almost immediately, and it was when I was only 24. So at 24 years old, I was being told by doctors, mm -hmm. you're just aging and you have small children, so of course you're tired. <laughs> Oh my. So let me ask you, you did research on these, the potential risks. And I'm assuming at that time, the doctors also addressed the potential risk that is associated with breast implant. Yes. I was told only like cosmetic or surgical related complications that could happen. Oh. Right. Which is what, what do, for the listeners, what are those kind of complications that you were told? So surgical complications would be infection, um, poor healing or necrosis, which is where the tissue actually starts to die. So mm -hmm. those sound scary, but they're pretty rare. And then capsular contracture, which is a condition where your body does not want those implants in there and it create it creates a shell, a protective shell around the implants, and it becomes very hard and very painful and can actually cause the breasts to become misshapen and even right. like symmetrical. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, well, that's good. At least they were able to explain the symptoms immediately after the breast implant replacement. Mm -hmm. Well, like you said, uh, whether it's you go through implants that are deflated or rupture and if, whether it's asymmetrical or different implant sizes. So basically what you're saying is they didn't give you the feedback on the potential risk with your health. Correct. Correct. And, so, and of course, did you also, were you aware of that there's also potential health risks associated with manufacturer brands or anything like that? What, did they tell you that this brand is better than the other or there was no such discussion from that angle? Not at all, no. Um, I researched brand types a little bit because some had been recalled in the past. Um, and my plastic surgeon used the brand Mentor, which is pretty popular in the United States and in mm -hmm. other countries. And I, I just didn't really question his choice in that. Based because on, of his experience, of course. Yeah, right. He did this, you know, he's a surgeon, he's a doctor, he's, you know, smart. And I also, you know, researched that there weren't any recalls that I could find of the types of implants that I was getting. And so I was ready to go. Wow, Jennifer, what shocks me right now is that most times that during the, after the breast implants, it takes about, about, 
you have a time lapse of when the symptoms do occur. And when you said that you started feeling tired, fatigue immediately, that just tells you that your body was not reacting properly from your implants. Right. And you were seeking help, but you were not getting the feedback you were looking for. Right. So what else did you do? I, I researched, I like my thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. um, I researched other autoimmune diseases because once you have one, you're more susceptible to others. Right. Um, and so I had tests for every autoimmune disease that they know to test for, and they could never find anything um, other than my inflammation markers would be elevated. So there was obviously inflammation in my body, but no one ever thought to blame the foreign objects in my body. Mm. Mm. That is that is that is something, and I'm I'm sorry that you had to go through this such an early stage, and you're not getting the answers that you're lo looking for. Just so the viewers understand, this is not a standalone issue. For you, it occurs throughout the board where the studies have indicated that there's one in 2000 and one in 86,000 uh, people who go through these surgery and they're, depending on the manufacturer brand, they may have these potential risks and symptoms that you are discuss discussing. What other symptoms are there that you're aware of that the listeners should be considering? There is a long list. <clears throat> I can tell you that um, after about, after my implants were about eight to 10 years old, I started developing a, a whole bunch of the symptoms on the list. I had strange muscle pains that no one could explain, um, deep bone pain. I was tested for cancer and fibromyalgia and mm -hmm could they could never figure that out. I had at least two to three episodes of pancreatitis unexplained. I don't drink alcohol ever. So that is obviously not the issue. I have Raynaud's phenomenon, which is pretty interesting. Um, whenever I get cold or when I wash my hands, the blood flow disappears from my fingertips and it happens in my toes. This is pretty common with breast implant illness. I would suffer from pretty severe dizziness. Um, I couldn't really help my husband in the yard, like pulling weeds, I would fall over. I had an almost complete loss of libido and um, which, you know, not only caused me to suffer, but also my poor husband. And goodness, the list is seriously so long. Like, I had so many of the symptoms on the list that I have to seriously, like, sit down and think, like, oh, yeah, I had that too. Oh, my. I am so sorry. And so, obviously, you were things like anxiety and loss of sleep. It's, uh, those were the breathing problems are another thing that you yes. must have been going through. Of course, memory and concentration. Brain fog. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand. Yes. And so basically, you are going through all types of neurological, hormonal, and autoimmune deficiencies with breast implant in a nutshell. Yes, they, right. they cause such an inflammatory response in your body for such a long period of time that it really starts to affect all of the other systems in your body. So it starts with the immune system and then moves on to endocrine and even your GI system. A lot of women suffer from all types of food sensitivities and intolerances and the, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On average, where, what is the onset of these symptoms? Some women are like me and they experience symptoms almost immediately. 
Um, and then some of them don't notice anything until eight, 10 years. Ten years. Um, some of them as early as four to six years. And the thought behind that is, especially with implants that have not ruptured, mm. is that that shell is constantly being attacked by the body and is constantly breaking down, therefore leaking all of the ingredients that are in silicone into the body. So it is a slow, steady poisoning right. of silicone and heavy metals and neurotoxins that are, you know, made when they make silicone. Mm. I am so sorry. You know, there was one, while we were talking offline, one of the interesting things that you mentioned, which I definitely think you might want to address to the listeners, are how the there's different levels of concerns and potential risk with the from the manufacturer's end. And also the communication from what which ones to utilize that are manufa manufacturer brands, as well as what physicians are communicating to you, the ones that should work and shouldn't work. I don't know if they are knowledgeable from that degree or if it's even communicated from the manufacturer to the physician. So I, um, the manufacturers and the FDA, the FDA finally did sort of acknowledge breast implant illness. Mm -hmm. um, I think what they had to say about it was a little bit snarky. They talked about um, the fact that some women are complaining, but that research needs to be done. But um, the symptoms are so common, in fact, that the manufacturers produce a pamphlet about them to mm. disperse with the implant so that the doctors can give them to the patients. But there's no requirement by the FDA for them to do so. As, as a matter of fact, when the surgeons receive the implants, they'll receive, you know, 30, 40, 50 pairs of implants and get five of those pamphlets. So you're just handed and you yeah. there's no communication? No, no. Wow. So... Okay, well, we understand the degree of risk that you've, we've addressed here and you've gone through. How did you, did you overcome them or did you, what, did, what steps and measures did you take once you understood that these symptoms were related to breast implant? So it, it took me forever. I, my implants were in for 17 and a half years, and I discovered breast implant illness about two and a half years ago. Oh my so gosh. It, it took me a, a really long time to, you know, get from there to here. And it was really by accident, I guess, <laughs> that a friend of mine sent me an article about one of Hugh Hefner's wives having her breast implant, uh, breast implants removed due to breast implant illness. And my mind was blown. She, you know, is a, a bombshell model. Her yeah. career was basically her body. And I was like in shock that this woman was willing to risk her career for you know her health for what she believed to be causing her health issues mm -hmm. so that to me said you know wow this i need to look into this that is serious and in my research came across a plethora of research and different support groups for women who suffer from this and reading their symptoms was mind-blowing. I couldn't believe that other women were experiencing the exact same thing that I had been experiencing and that they were also told by their doctors, you're just depressed. This is all in your head. We can't find anything wrong with you. You know, go home and take some pills. So did you finally find a physician that would help you out? 
because clearly there's not many according to you that are knowledgeable in this area. They understand about giving the support with breast implant augmentation, but when it comes to the symptoms or when it comes to making sure that if you are having these illnesses and concerns that there's a reverse factor involved in it. So right. what did you do? So, so many things to consider. Um, one of the reasons why I feel so passionate about sharing this is one, um, so many women have no idea that this could be why they're feeling sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two, a lot of women do find this out, but they go to their original plastic surgeon or just whoever's closest and are made to feel awful and like they're stupid because they think that this could be the cause of their problems. Um, I had an experience a lot like that where I went to a local plastic surgeon hoping that he would do it the way that I, you know, researched and it, and it needs to be done properly. And his first question to me, very first question was, what does your husband think? Yeah. And I was, I was shocked. I didn't know what to say at first. And yeah, how like, would you be able to say anything? Yeah, else? I'm, you know, I'm coming to him because I'm tired. I hurt. I'm dizzy. Um, I get flu like symptoms all the time. And he's, you know, telling me the same thing every other physician has told me. And, you know, wants to know, is my husband going to be sad if I'm flat chested again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I see that in the support groups still all the time that women are talked to like this by their plastic surgeons, some of whom are even female plastic surgeons. And that was my next question. Yeah. I guess it doesn't matter what type of... It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just, I want to make sure that other women know that there are, are good doctors out there who will do this properly and that they don't have to put themselves through that. Well, thank you for those because that's important for everyone to know. Physicians or doctors, they have the right to their own opinions and feedback, but the main thing is for us to do our own due diligence and understand our own intuition of what's going on with ourselves. Right. And I'm so proud of the fact that you were able to find ways to get yourself the help. Was there anyone who was lucky enough to give you that support? Um, I follow a Facebook group that is a huge support that grows by about 250 women a day. And um, through that group have become friends with a lot of women who suffer with the same illness. Mm -hmm. And it also helped me find out that I had friends already that I knew that were suffering with this. Like and, when you say anything? Yeah, we just don't talk about oh. our boobs. So <laughs> not this <laughs> So I, I learned all the time, like, oh, my, my goodness, there are thousands of us. And I knew a huge handful of them already. And so it just helped us bond and connect on a whole different level. And it's been beautiful. That's amazing. And uh, kudos to the one person, the doctor that who was able to help you during the surgery to remove. Yes. Right? And yes. So how, let's, let's talk about, okay, so you went through these symptoms, you went through these potential risks. Once you have the support, how did your body feel? Did you still go through these exact symptoms? Uh, was it better? What, what happened after the removal? So I had my surgery on July 1st. So I'm just over my 30-day my post-op mark, which is so exciting. And um, immediately, and it's funny, if you go to the Facebook groups and you see women who have had their breast implants removed, one of the things that they say is, 
they wake up from anesthesia and they can take a deep breath for the first time in the earth. And I thought, you know, kind of cliche, but you know. It's true. (laughs) But I I took a breath and I was like, I have been, you know, having a hard time breathing for 17 years. Like that's, that is insane. And then the next thing, you know, my husband is looking at me on the couch and he says, your eyes are so white and bright and the inflammation is like gone from your face. And I was like, I couldn't, it was so relieving and validating that through all of this, all of these, you know, still lots of naysayers and a lot of my physicians thinking, you know, telling me, go ahead and remove them, but it's probably not going to help you. And immediately I started feeling better. So no more neck and shoulder pain already. Yes. Um, A couple of bad detox days I've had, but they seem to be spreading out further and further apart from each other. So I have already had a lot of relief and I'm excited. It's a great feeling for you to actually breathe and feel better. And I'm so proud of you. And we would definitely like to follow your journey of understanding where it's taking you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, in thir- wow, just recently you went through this procedure. Yeah. I, you know, you're, you're an inspiration for sure. So I noticed a study, I uh, read somewhere on, um, it was published in Harvard Health Online, Harvard's Women's Health Watch, that it mentions what you're saying about the FDA recommends that there are potential risks of procedure with, with your doctor. And, and these risks are tremendous. And that's why it concerns me that there has been studies, there have been warning signs. So why are we not taking these procedures more seriously? That's the biggest concern and confusion I have around this. Right. Well, breast implants are, breast augmentation is the second most popular plastic surgery in the world right now. Right. So huge money maker. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So of course we don't, you know, people don't want to lose out on that money making opportunity. So that's where you see a lot of this research not getting out to the public mm-hmm. like it should be. And um, even sort of being swept under the rug in a lot of cases. You're absolutely right. It's all due to making money. And that's why we're not as vocal and not as concerning about the human health. And I think we need to do more of addressing these health concerns. What, are, what can we do to bring more further awareness, I guess? Right. Well, the breast implant illness groups are amazing because they bring to light the, mm-hmm. just the realities of breast implant illness. So symptoms, doctors that you can go to that will actually listen to you. They have lists for women. Um, you can find a doctor close to your area, worldwide even. So if this mm-hmm. is obviously not an issue just for women in the U.S. And um, they're a great uh, support system for women who are going through this for lots of reasons. They feel awful. Their families sometimes are also some of the people that are telling them that they're crazy and that there's no way their breast implants are doing this to them. Their doctors aren't listening to them. So the group is a great place for them to go where they will be heard. And then I feel very passionate about helping women overcome self-confidence issues regarding this. Right. Whether it's before breast implants, they maybe they feel like they need them for some reason, or they have them and they're really, really afraid to get rid of the implants because they're afraid of how they'll look or 
whether or not their spouse will still be attracted to them or in whatever confidence issues you could think of that surround how a woman yeah. looks. Right. So, and thank you for this. I think it would be great for us to follow these groups for those women who are potentially thinking about it or how going through it. Are there any type of alternative options other than just constructive surgery or any type of implants? Um, the most popular right now, other than breast implants, is fat transfer. Right. Um, okay. Not all women are a good candidate for that. Hmm. Uh, not all of them have enough fat to transfer. And then in order to do that, liposuction is involved, which also carries risks. Um, and then when the fat is transferred into the breast tissue, only a small portion of it actually survives. And when those fat cells die, it can cause like a calcification or an anomaly in the breast, which can cause issues for women later down the road when they go mm -hmm. to get mammograms. These anomalies can look like something, you know, that could be scary. So that's it definitely definitely safer than breast implant um but not without its own risks yes, absolutely yeah so then your safest measure is to love your own body yes. and love yourself the way you are <clears throat> yes absolutely thank you jennifer uh is there anything you'd like to tell our listeners today um i want everyone to know if you you yourself feel like this could be your breast implants could be causing your illness or if you know somebody who this could be an issue for please reach out please let myself know or um, comment on the facebook live so that we can tell you where to go to get the help that you need i want everybody to know that you're perfect just the way you are and you don't need to butcher your body to make yourself look like society says you should look. So be kind to yourself, take care of yourself, and love yourself. Thank you. Thank you for this. All right. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. And I will definitely provide them links and resources of how to reach out to you if they have any concerns or are potentially thinking about breast implants. I think it'd be a great way for you to support them. And I really appreciate you coming on the show today and giving us the tremendous amount of knowledge to, to our audience, because I think it's an eye opener for many of us. Thank you. And we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. So there you have it. Thank you so much for listening today. And if you want to be part of the show or talk about any health area topics that you have, please reach out and let's let the world know and make them more aware, one voice at a time. Take care. Love you guys. Have a good day.